All right, Psalm 88 is it's a little bit different than, than many of the other psalms that we've looked at in the sense that it's, uh, uh, the similarity is there's a crying out to the Lord, right? A crying out to um, the Father is like, like a prayer and just a request to, for help. But there's not really much uh, uh, positive in this, in this psalm. It's kind of a, a darker psalm. And just right off the bat, I'm just going to come out and say, you know, what, what I believe that this psalm, is, as many of the psalms are very prophetic, some like entire psalms are just completely like about Jesus Christ and prophetic and others, you know, maybe more or less so, or maybe not more so, but less so, uh, you know, if the entire psalm's about it, how it could be more? But um, this one, I believe, is all about Christ, and I believe that this is referring to Christ and his uh, descent into hell. And as we go through the scripture, I'm going to just try to, I, I want you to kind of be thinking about that as we go through verse by verse, because literally like this whole thing, I think we could uh, deduce that this is talking about Christ and not just, um, you know, like David or someone else, as well as uh, that, that hell is being referenced, even though it's not specifically called out by, you know, directly as being hell. It's not specifically calling out Christ, uh, but I think we could deduce both of these from the passage itself. So, um, and then I'm also going to just go it more in depth because, of course, the doctrine that Christ's soul went to hell is a very important doctrine, but it's not something that, like, if someone just asked me, why do you believe Christ's soul went to hell? I'm just going to be like, well, Psalm 88. I mean, clearly. Right? Like, that's not the, the go-to passage to support the doctrine. This is supplementary. So I'm going to go through some other passages. Uh, I've done this in the past, but I'm going to do it again, because believe it or not, this is a, this is a doctrine. I, I know at least one person, there's probably been a couple more, that has stopped coming to our church over this doctrine. So for some people, this is a very, very, very big deal about uh, this belief and... Um, you know, that's, it is what it is. I personally wouldn't choose to stop attending a church, a good soul winning uh, church over that, but uh, people have. And it's something that, that people get real passionate over and, and real zealous about, so, um, which is fine. It's great to get passionate about the Bible, amen, about the Word of God, but let's, let's make sure that we have a zeal according to knowledge, right? And, and see what the scripture says and, and, and uncover just what's the truth about it. And it is what it is, right? So uh, whether it offends people or not, let's just try to make sure our doctrine is good and pure. So uh, that's the plan for this evening as we dig into this. So let's look down there at verse number one and start going through Psalm 88, verse by verse. The Bible says there in verse number one, O Lord, God of my salvation, I have cried day and night before thee. Let my prayer come before thee, incline thine ear unto my cry. And again, these first two verses, is this is nothing really new for, uh, compared to many of the other psalms, just the entreaty to the Lord to hear prayer, right? That this is some, there's something very serious. I've cried before you day and night. Um, you know, listen to me and incline thine ear to my cry. Verse 3, for my soul is full of troubles, and my life draweth nigh unto the grave. So he's saying, I'm like, I'm about to die or to the grave. I'm, um, I'm getting close to death. So please hear me. This is, this is gr a grave matter. Verse number four, I am counted with them that go down into the pit. I am as a man that hath no strength. Now, I believe first and foremost that the, that the, the primary application of this verse here, I am counted with them that go down into the pit. I don't think that that's just referring to hell. I think that's talking about people who are dying and going to the grave, like a pit in the earth. Even though, like, like very commonly, the, the hell is referred to as the pit, right? That that is a place for hell. I do think this is also applying to hell in this context in the entire psalm. But just literally, directly, when he's talking about my life drawing nigh into the grave, I'm counted with them that go down into the pit. I am as a man that hath no strength. I mean, this is just referring to him as just approaching death and about ready to die. Right, But from a more prophetic standpoint, because remember, these psalms, they are still written by like a human author, and you will very frequently have more than one application of these passages because you have one aspect that could be seen from a regular person, and you have the other aspect where it's like about Jesus, right? So from... 
a person's perspective, someone who's ready to die, but from Jesus' perspective, about him ready to die, he's not just about to go to the grave, but he's actually about to descend into the pit that we know as, you know, the center of the earth, which is hell. But this isn't like my conclusive proof. Don't worry. I, I already said that I still think that this is kind of him talking about going to the grave. So let's keep reading here. I am as a man that hath no strength. Verse 5, free among the dead, like the slain that lie in the grave, whom thou rememberest no more, and they are cut off from thy hand. Now, I didn't have this in my notes to go over this, but there were, I, I think this is the passage. I've had, I've had a JW come uh, and point me to a passage, either this passage or a passage similar to this. I actually, I think it was a different passage, which is why I wasn't going to bring it up. But in any case, um, they, make, they, they tried to make the case that, like, for soul sleep, because that's one of the things that they believe. If you don't know what soul sleep is, it's basically that people, some people believe this, Seventh day Adventists, some other people believe this stuff, that when you die on this earth, right, your body goes into the grave, that you, like, you have no consciousness, and that you're basically just like you're asleep until the return of Christ and the resurrection, that they just believe that, like, you just have no idea of anything that's going on. It's like you're just asleep in the ground. Okay, clearly it's a false doctrine. It's not true. The Bible says that Abraham rejoiced to see my day. You know, Jesus said that about himself. So he clearly wasn't sleeping. I mean, how is he rejoicing to see Christ <laughs> if, if he was asleep in the ground, right? So, I mean, there's, there's many ways you can just destroy that. But... This is what they'll say, and even with, um, with JWs, they believe in not just a soul sleep, but they believe in, in, in annihilation also. So they'll believe that if someone, people who get cast into hell, that it's not eternal torture and torment, it's they're just burned up and then they cease to exist and they're just gone and they just aren't there anymore. And I've had people... I've had someone turn to a, a verse similar to this because I don't think this was exactly the one. But when it says, whom thou rememberest no more, you know, like, that like, well, see, look, there's no memory of you anymore so because, because you're just gone. I mean, if you were still burning in hell, then there'd be some knowledge of you, some memory, you know, it's, just, it's kind of a dumb argument because when it's talking about death, when people die on this earth, it's talking about the remembrance from people in this earth, right? Like, just, just people stop thinking about you after a while. I mean, everyone, everyone. Now, there's some people that if you're really close to them, some close familial relationship, you, you would probably think of maybe until the day you die. But generally speaking, you know, the, 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 the more people that you get in contact with, the, the, many, many more of them will be, and then after a generation or two, your name's forgotten, right? No one's talking about you. I mean, when's the last time you talked about your great-great-grandfather? Or thought about him, for that matter. Do you even know anything about him? I don't know. You know what I mean? Like, this is, this is what happens, right? It's pretty simple. So when we see uh, verses like this, that's all it's referring to is that, is that type of death where they say there's no more remembrance of you anymore because you're gone. I mean, there's been generations and thousands and thousands of years of people living and dying that people have no idea ever existed on this planet to begin with. So it says here, Free among the dead, verse 5 again, Like the slain that lie in the grave whom thou rememberest no more. And they are cut off from thy hand. Thou hast laid me in the lowest pit, in darkness, in the deeps. So now I, I think we've gone beyond just the pit of the grave, right? That, that pit, that first pit that we were reading about in verse 4. To read. Now he's talking about like the lowest pit in darkness and in the deeps. Okay, the deeps is referred to, to about, the, about the bottoms of like the ocean. So, it's, I mean, it's talking about just like down, way, way, way down. Not six feet under, you know, just way down into the depths, which is where hell is located. In the lowest pit, in darkness, in the deeps. Thy wrath lieth hard upon me, and thou hast afflicted, afflicted me with all thy waves. Selah. So now this is talking about not just God's anger, you know, like his wrath. He's pouring out wrath, which, of course, we know that uh, the Bible says that it, it, it pleased God to bruise him, talking about Christ, and that Jesus tasted death for every man. And I believe that, 
uh, Christ did die and go to hell, and that hell was not a pleasant place. And again, I'll get more in depth on teaching why I believe, you know, why I could prove that from Scripture, not just believe it, but, but prove it doctrinally. But what you'll see also, when you look at references to hell, to the pit, to everlasting destruction, to any, any type of, you know, outer darkness, anything that would have any relevance to hell, you will never find either a good place or a neutral place. It's always bad. It's always very bad. I mean, you can never find an example of something, especially something like paradise, because there's some people out there that will say that, well, paradise was in the center of the earth, and when Jesus went to hell, he really went to paradise, or Jesus went to this place. He went there, but, like, it wasn't bad for him, and, like, he, he preached to people in hell or something like that, and it's just kind of like, why? But... Um, that's what some people say, but we, we look at this passage here, okay, clearly whoever this is speaking, talking about the lowest pit in darkness, in the deeps, and the wrath of God lying hard upon them. There's enough there to, to say, yeah, I think we might be talking about hell here, and then if we're talking about hell, then who is this talking? I mean, it's not, it's not the psalmist, right? The psalmist didn't die and go to hell, but we see many, many accounts, especially and specifically in Psalms, that are from the perspective of Christ. There's prophecies that come from the perspective of Christ. Uh, Psalm 69, we're going to look at Psalm 22 in a little bit. You, could, you, know, you can see this uh, where, 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 it's, you know, where Jesus said, like, I may tell all my bones, right? That's, that's in the Psalms. That's a psalmist that's preaching the word of God, that's giving the word of God. But that's from Jesus Christ's own perspective. So let's keep reading here. Verse number eight, thou hast put away mine acquaintance far from me. Thou hast made me an abomination unto them. I am shut up and I cannot come forth. So a lot here as well, putting his acquaintance far from him. I mean, you think about one of the verses that popped into my mind, I came unto my own, my own received me not. So Jesus' acquaintance, his own a uh, kin, right? He came unto them and then they were put away from him and he was made an abomination unto them, right? He was made hated uh, of, of men in order to take that punishment and die for us. Um, and even his acquaintance, when he died and went to hell, like none of his friends were with him. Right? He, had, he had to go and do this alone. And even from the garden, when everyone forsook him, then he pretty much had to go it alone from there on out until he suffered the death on the cross and then descended into hell. So his acquaintance has been put far from him. He was made an abomination unto them. And he says, I am shut up. So he's, he's concealed, he's contained, and I cannot come forth. And eventually he does, of course, because he was dead for three days and three nights. But while he was there, he's not, he's not leaving. He can't leave, right? He can't leave until... Uh, he can fulfill the rest of the prophecy of the resurrection on the third day. So, and I think of that, just the words, you know, cannot come forth. What did he say to Lazarus? You know, Lazarus come forth when he called him, when he, when he resurrected Lazarus out of the grave. And he's saying, well, I'm shut up. I can't come forth. So again, this is that perspective of while he's in hell, having his acquaintance, the wrath of God, the lowest pit, the darkness, the deep, um, all of these references being given here. Verse number 10. Wilt thou show wonders to the dead? Shall the dead arise and praise thee? And here we're seeing, okay, first of all, from the perspective that's not Christ, when some, for someone who's near to death and has all of these problems coming on them, you have the, hey, look, what good is it going to be for me to die? Right? Like, like once I die, I, I can't be praising you here on earth. I can't be giving you praise and living for you and doing all these things while I'm dead is essentially what this is talking about. But I love that it says, shall the dead arise and praise thee because there we have more allusion to the resurrection of Christ. Right? So as we're seeing his from the perspective, as I believe the, per, the perspective of Christ, we're seeing this uh, in this question, shall the dead arise and praise thee? And of course, in general, the answer is going to be no, because when we die as human beings, we're not just rising again 
to praise the Lord. There is a resurrection one day, but here from the perspective of Christ, uh, we see that, that Jesus Christ will um, arise and praise the Lord. Verse number 11, shall thy destruction be declared, excuse me, shall, <laughs> shall thy loving kindness, my eyes jumped down a little bit, shall thy loving kindness be declared in the grave or thy faithfulness in destruction. Um, again, just what good is it for someone who's dead? I can't praise you. I can't do all these things. Um, I can't show your loving kindness. I can't show your faithfulness if I'm dead and down here. And these are also things that besides a, a regular human being could say, also Jesus could be saying in hell, hey, look, um, you know, I need to be released from this prison where I can't come forth. Uh, in order to show the loving kindness and the faithfulness. Shall thy wonders be known in the dark and thy righteousness in the land of forgetfulness. So um, all of these verses here from verses 10 through 12, you've got the, you know, the dead, the grave, destruction, dark, land of forgetfulness, Again, I, I, to me, it just speaks that it's a little bit more than just death, uh, the destruction part, just uh, the, the depth. And then um, verse 13 says, But unto thee have I cried, O Lord, and in the morning shall my prayer prevent thee. Lord, why castest thou off my soul? Why hidest thou thy face from me? And we've seen this in other Psalms before, and this is, could be a common question for someone who's going through a hardship, right? That's saying, hey, why, why does it feel like you're not with me, God? Why does it feel like you've turned away from me? Why does it feel like you're not there? Which is going to be one application of Psalm 88, but then we also have Jesus Christ when he, when he literally became sin for us, when the Bible says he bare the sins of the whole world in his own body on the tree, and when Jesus Christ was on the cross and he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Right? And he had that, uh, that feeling, and not just a feeling, but God like forsaking him as he's on the cross because he became sin for us, not because he had his own sin, but because he had our sin, and he was getting the full brunt of the, the, the burden of our sin he was bearing for us. So part of that is being forsaken of God. Right? If we die in our sins, we're forsaken of God, and you're going to die and go to hell, which is exactly what happened to Jesus Christ. He died not in his sins. He died in our sins. And he died forsaken of God. And he died and went to hell to pay that punishment for us. So the question, though, is, hey, why, why have you cast off my soul? And why do you hide your face from me? Now, turn back, if you would, to Psalm 22. We'll come back to Psalm 88. But I, I made reference to this earlier, and we're going to read through this pretty quickly. I've already done a Bible study through Psalm 22, but it's good to see these verses and uh, just to support what I'm teaching about this being from Christ's perspective in Psalm 88, because Psalm 22 is clearly one of those verses, one of those passages that does this. And some of these other passages, I'll admit, are more clear because they have more like, references in the New Testament that, that absolutely, without any shadow of a doubt, tie them together unequivocally, right? We don't have as much of that in Psalm 88 because it's just a little bit more, um, I'll call it generic, but it's, it's just, it's a little bit more broad. It's not referenced 100% directly from the New Testament, but just based off of the content, it just, it, it just fits perfectly. Look at Psalm 22, verse 1. The Bible says, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me, right? This is uh, what I was just quoting, which is also Jesus literally said in the New Testament when he was on the cross. So, um, that, that there's your clear direction. <laughs> like, yeah, this is, this is prophesying Jesus Christ and is about him. Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? So it's the same sentiment that we just read in Psalm 88. Why castest thou off my soul? Why hidest thou thy face from me? Right? These are the same sentiments being brought forth here. Verse 2, O my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not, and in the night season, and am not silent. And this also is applicable to what we saw earlier in Psalm 88. Uh, I, in verse 1, I have cried day and night before thee. Remember? So, as we continue here, verse 3, But thou art holy, O thou that inhabited 
inhabitest the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in thee. They trusted, and thou didst deliver them. They cried unto thee, and were delivered. They trusted in thee, and were not confounded. But I am a worm, and no man, a reproach of men, and despised of the people. All they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head, saying, He trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighted in him. And again, this, is, this was literally spoken by people who were mocking him on the cross, right? So we have very clear connections back to Psalm 22. But we saw these same allusions to the same sentiments being brought forth also in Psalm 88. Uh, when, it, when he's talking about his, um, when his acquaintance being far from him and he was made an abomination, right? Let's keep reading Psalm 22, verse number 80. Trust on the Lord, or excuse me, verse number 9. But thou art he that took me out of the womb. Thou didst make me hope when I was upon my mother's breasts. I was cast upon thee from the womb. Thou art my God from my mother's belly. Be not far from me. For trouble is near, for there is none to help. Many bulls have compassed me, strong bulls of Bashan have beset me round. They gaped upon me with their mouths as a ravening and a roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue cleaveth to my jaws. And thou hast brought me into the dust of death. For dogs have compassed me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I may tell all my bones. They look and stare upon me. They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. But be not thou far from me, O Lord. O my strength, haste thee to help me. Deliver my soul from the sword, my darling from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth, for thou hast heard me from the horns of the unicorns. I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. Ye that fear the Lord, praise him. All ye the seed of Jacob, glorify him and fear him. All ye the seed of Israel. Now look, we haven't finished Psalm 22 yet, but has the context stopped yet at all about being about Jesus Christ from his perspective? No, of course not. So this is a significant portion of scripture where it's just verse after verse after verse after verse after verse, which is what I'm claiming Psalm 88 is also about. Yes, you have another application that can be one that's more applied towards a regular person, a believer, but also a, a, a primary application about Christ himself and a prophecy about him. Let's keep reading here. Just finish off Psalm 22. He said, I'm not going too deep into this, but I do like reading through it because it's so similar to Psalm 88 when we know Psalm 22 is clearly about Christ. No question about it. No one will deny that. Nobody. There's way too much evidence to, to show otherwise. But as we read through this, we see, oh, wow, Psalm 88 really does line up very closely with that. But it also takes a slightly different direction because it brings up so much about the grave, about the dark, about, the you know, ab about that aspect of it, which is why I think that's, that's the, whole, the whole point is it's, it's focusing on the descent into hell and about the, um, you know, the foreshadowing of that descent, too. So, like, before it even happens, just the thought of that happening in the in kind of a dread of that verse no let's see where did we leave off verse number uh 23 ye that fear the lord praise him all you the seed of jacob glorify him and fear him all you the seed of israel for he hath not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted neither hath he hid his face from him but when he cried unto him he heard my praise shall be of thee in the great congregation i will pay my vows before them that fear him the meek shall eat and be satisfied. They shall praise the Lord that seek him. Your heart shall live forever. All the ends of the world shall remember and turn unto the Lord, and all the kindreds of the nation shall worship before thee. For the kingdom is the Lord's, and he is the governor among the nations. All they that be fat upon earth shall eat and worship. All they that go down to the dust shall bow before him, and none can keep alive his own soul. A seed shall serve him, it shall be accounted to the Lord for a generation. They shall come and shall declare his righteousness unto a people that shall be born that he hath done this. The entire psalm, Psalm 22, is just about Jesus Christ completely, 100%. Primarily, that's what it's about. Um, let's go back to Psalm 88 and pick up here. Because we, saw, we left off with the sentiment of, Why castest thou off my soul? Why hidest thou thy face from me? Verse 15, Psalm 88 says, I am afflicted... And ready to die 
from my youth up while I suffer thy terrors I am distracted now how many people would you say are gonna say yeah you know what I'm ready to die from my youth up Jesus knew what his mission was here he was literally born to die I mean that that was the purpose that was the goal he came into this world so that he could die and pay for our sins he wouldn't have done it if he didn't have to but that's what he had to do. He had to come as well. He had to be born of a virgin. He had to live the perfect life. He had to do miracles. And he had to die in order to atone for our sins. He had to make that payment. And that was the only way he could do it. So he was literally born to die. He came to this earth in order to pay for our sins, ready to die from my youth up. And he knew what his, I mean, he, was, he didn't even tell everyone else about it. Until a little bit later in his ministry, he started revealing it unto his disciples, talking about how he's going to have to be arrested, he's going to have to be beaten, he's going to have to be uh, put to death, but then he's going to rise again from the dead. And of course, his disciples didn't know what that was until later, but he knew. He knew the plan. He was aware of this, even though like, he became a human being and he had some limitations of being a human while simultaneously being God, God in the flesh, he was... He, he had that knowledge and that wisdom from his youth. And I think we're seeing this expressed here. This verse particular kind of gets a little bit harder for people to uh, apply to someone else, right? To just kind of anyone else. And I'm not saying it can't be done. Of course, you can say, well, someone who's saved and someone who has this really great godly mindset from their youth that they're ready to die for the cause of Christ or something like that. Of course, but... That absolutely was Jesus Christ that, had, that we could say uh, definitely would have that, that mindset and know from his youth. While I suffer thy terrors, I am distracted. Verse 16, thy fierce wrath goeth over me. Thy terrors have cut me off. They came round about me daily like water. They compassed me about together. Lover and friend, hast thou put far from me and mine acquaintance into darkness. And this is how the psalm ends. That's not a very uplifting psalm from this perspective, which again, I think the whole point, though, is to just highlight the, the, the gravity, because it's of the grave, of not just a grave, though, of, of hell and what Jesus suffered. So it's this perspective of... Of, uh, of the wrath of God and what he had to suffer and the seriousness of it. And just even this, this reference here. So um, turn, if you would, to the book of Jonah, chapter number 2. When he's talking about the wrath of God going over me, obviously it's, it's, it's a song, it's poetic, so this language is used. But we see another connection from this in verse 17, I believe, where he says, They came round about me daily like water. They compassed me about together. Talking about the, the, the wrath of God and the terrors being all around him. And yeah, I mean, it's all like being submerged in water. But we see another reference to hell in Jonah and in Jonah chapter 2. While you're turning to Jonah chapter 2, I'm going to read for you from Matthew chapter 12, which... Matthew 12 is a clear connection between something that's clearly taught by Jesus going to hell for three days and three nights and Jonah chapter 2. Okay, so we have this tie-in to where when you read Jonah, you're going like, oh, well, is this talking about Jonah? Is it talking about Jesus? What's this talking about? I don't really know because there's, it's, it's intermixed with events that literally happen to Jonah with then prophecy of Jesus Christ. It's, it kind of goes almost every other verse. There's like some verses that apply directly to Jonah, and then there's some verses that apply directly to Christ's soul being in hell. But Jesus Christ makes this reference back to Jonah. In Matthew 12, verse uh, 38, the Bible reads, Then certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. So they, they keep on asking Jesus for a sign. They want to see a sign. Uh, to prove he's the son of God. Verse 39 says, But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. So he said, You want a sign? Here's your sign. This is, this is what you're going to get for a sign. And he says, For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man 
be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Now that statement alone clearly demonstrates that Jesus Christ went to hell. The Son of Man went to hell for three days and three nights because he calls it the heart of the earth. The heart of anything is in the center. The heart in our bodies is in the midst of our chest, like pretty much in the center. The heart of an avocado is right in the middle, right? It's, a, it's the core, right? And, and there's in the earth, in the heart of the earth, there's a core, Right? That's what science calls it, at least. So you got this core. And, and guess what science tells us, too? It's really, 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 really hot down there. And you don't need modern science to tell you that. You see a volcano erupt. It's coming from down, and it's shooting up hellfire up into the earth and then, you know, on, on the planet. So, like, it, it's clearly obvious. You don't have to have, you know, some science degree to understand this. First, you can just have faith in the Word of God about hell, but it's, it's also just clearly demonstrated that what's going on below and, of course, is confirmed through scientific evidence. So Jesus refers to Jonah being three days and three nights in the whale's belly and comparing that to the Son of Man being three days and three nights in the heart. Now, keeping that in mind, let's look at Jonah chapter 2, verse number 1. Because this is right after Jonah was, was cast off of the boat that he was on, the ship he was on, and then a, a whale came and swallowed him up. Verse number one says, Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord, God, the Lord his God out of the fish's belly. So where is Jonah? He's in the fish's belly. Verse two, And said, I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me. Out of the belly of hell cried I, and thou heardest my voice. Now, is Jonah in hell? Literally, no. Now, he's in a place that can be hell-like because he's in a belly, which I would imagine the gases and the stink in a belly of a, of a whale is going to be pretty nasty, right? There may be some digestive fluids in there and, and whatever else was eaten by the whale, uh, uh, being decomposed there. So, it's, I mean, obviously, a really, it's also going to be dark, like really, really, really dark. No light coming in at all as this whale swimming under the water. He's got his mouth closed. I mean, you're, you're stuck in that, in that belly in total darkness. So, you have a lot of similarities to hell in general, but Jonah didn't die and go to hell. First of all, Jonah was saved, okay, as a prophet of the Lord, and two, he didn't die. He was just in that belly. And the whole reason for that is because he was representative of what the Son of Man was going to do later on. I mean, there's, there's a whole purpose. that God had a grand purpose. It wasn't just to humble Jonah that, that he got swallowed up by a whale. Right? For three days and three nights, literally. There was, there's more to it than that, obviously. And then this statement here, as Jonah, being a prophet is prophesying of Jesus Christ going to hell. Out of the belly of hell cried I, and thou heardest my voice. So, by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord is, is why he cried. Some people say, oh, Jesus Christ, he, didn't, he wasn't being heard or anything like that. Well, if, and I, I think it is, if this is prophesying Christ, and it's saying, out of reason of mine affliction, the affliction didn't stop on the cross. It continued after his ascent into hell. And, and this lines up perfectly. But let's keep reading. because there's, there's so much evidence for this in Scripture about Christ's soul not only uh, going to hell, but being punished in hell. And I mean, you have just the logical reason alone of if the payment for our sins without Christ is to die and go to hell to pay for our sins, and Jesus came and paid for our sins, why wouldn't it be the same payment? Like, literally, why wouldn't it be the same? Why would it be a different punishment? I mean, if I was going to pay for something for you, why would it be a different price? Right. Yeah, I'll pay for that for you. Whether, whether it's something you did wrong, some punishment you're going to receive, or just spending money on you know, whatever it is, like anything, anything. Yeah, I'll pay that for you so you don't have to. Well, why would it be any different for me? 
And even Jesus, you could say, oh, yeah, but he didn't have his own sin. Yeah, but he's paying for everyone else's sin. He's paying for everyone else's sin. I mean, at least when I die, I'd only have to pay for my sins. But he paid for everybody's sins. So why would it be a different pun a punishment? Why? It doesn't make sense. But let's keep reading here because there's a lot more in this, in this passage. Verse 3, For thou hadst cast, cast me into the deep in the midst of the seas. Look at this. And the floods compassed me about. All thy billows and thy waves passed over me. Now this is talking about Jonah because he was in the sea and li this was literally happening to him. Then I said, I am cast out of thy sight, yet I will look again toward thy holy temple. The waters compassed me about even to the soul. The depth closed me round about. The weeds were wrapped about my head. I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. The earth with her bars was about me forever. Yet hast thou brought up my life from corruption, O Lord my God. Now, Jonah did not go down to the bottoms of the mountains. I mean, the pressure alone would probably kill him even in the whale's belly. But it's also, he also says that the earth with her bars was about me forever. And this is the reference of hell being a prison, right? And, and interestingly enough, too, we also have scientific evidence that there is like an iron or there's, 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 there's a metal, there's metallic substance in the core of the earth also. So it's thought to be molten, but still it's, it's like there's that element is down there. Now, obviously, no one's dug down there, but, the, you know, they're able to send uh, different type of, of frequencies of waves down there to, you know, and then bounce back to, to get, you know, s sonic waves, things like that, to, to sort of see what the, how, how the frequency comes back to determine what type of materials it's hitting uh, when it comes back. So uh, there's that type of, of evidence scientifically, which, hey, that's great, but Again, the Bible has already told us about these things. We, we know uh, enough that that's, that that's there. So he's talking about this, uh, the earth with her bars was about me forever. So if that's talking about a period of time, obviously people go to hell are there forever. Or if he's re kind of staying it more in like everywhere I look, it's just around me kind of forever. That would be referencing the, the center of the earth and, and having no escape and no way out. Right? Does it make sense? Verse 7, when my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord and my prayer came in unto thee, into thine holy temple. They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy, but I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord and the Lord spake unto the fish and it vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. And that took three days and three nights. Jonah was in the whale's belly for three days and three nights. Jesus Christ was in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. We can see enough uh, reference here, clearly referring to hell, clearly referring to uh, that pit. And that would, that is some evidence there that Jesus Christ referenced, saying, hey, this is what it's going to be like. This is your sign. I'm going to that place. Jonah already prophesied about it. Psalm 22 prophesied. Psalm 88 prophesied. Turn, if you would, to Exodus chapter 12. Because the Passover lamb prophesies of Jesus Christ's soul going to hell also. And not a good part of hell either. The fiery part of hell. And some of you might have heard all this before. You might have heard some of these references before. Write them down, though, and know them. You'd be able to defend and, and explain why you believe what you believe about this doctrine. Take note of them. And if you don't believe what I'm saying, then you better come up with an answer as to what this stuff actually means then. I mean, seriously, take it serious, right? If you, if you say, no, Pastor Bird, there's no way, I don't think that's true. Well, then explain to me what, you know, Jonah 2. Is that, is that literally talking about Jonah? It's not prophetic about Christ? 
even though Christ referred to it about him going to hell, you really believe that Jonah cried out of the belly of hell? Or that he was just saying that because it was like hell, but, it not, not, but not really? Okay. Exodus 12, verse 5. And we know that the sacrifices, in, as a collective, just in general as a whole, all would represent Jesus Christ's sacrifice, right? And, and there's, there's different sacrifices in different ways. You've got the scapegoat, which is, symbolizes one way of him separating us from our sin as far as the east is from the west when they put the, the sins onto the head of the goat and sent it off into a far land, right? There's all these different aspects and all these different cool things and different aspects of these various sacrifices that will demonstrate some, some different truths. But as a whole, collectively, in general, the shedding of blood, the killing of the sacrifice, right? Those are all common. But the one sacrifice that is probably referred to the most and is the most specific and the most just absolutely geared for a picture and a representation of Jesus Christ is the Passover lamb sacrifice. Amen. I mean, John the Baptist literally said, Behold the Lamb of God, which cometh to take away the sins of the whole world, right? I mean, Jesus is the lamb, right? He's a lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Many places he's talking about the lamb. So if we're going to look at just one sacrifice that's going to be representative of Christ and his sacrifice that he made, it's the Passover lamb. And as we read this, you're going to see so many ways in which Jesus Christ fulfilled this. In fact, every way. Every way. Look at verse number five. The Bible says, your lamb shall be without blemish. Well, was Jesus Christ without blemish? Absolutely. He was without sin. A male of the first year. Jesus Christ was a male. Of course he was a male, right? He's the son of God. Ye shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats, and ye shall keep it up until the 14th day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. Isn't that what happened to Jesus Christ? Literally. Amen. He was kept until the 14th day because he was killed at Passover. I mean, literally he was. Like, this wasn't just... Uh, you know, something they did at this time and Jesus Christ represented at a different time. No, it, he literally died on Passover. Like, that's when he died. He was that Passover lamb, literally. And all Israel said, crucify him, crucify him. Verse 7, And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and an upper door post of the houses wherein they shall eat it. The door posts are made out of what? wood. And if you show how you would paint the, the, the doorposts and the top, you're going to, you know, kind of make a little symbol of a cross. Now that, again, that's not the, the oh wow, that proves it right there. No, but the, the shedding of blood, blood shedding on the wood, I mean, come on. Right? Of course, of course, this is talking about Christ. And his, and his literal sacrifice and his literal death and how it all happened. And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. And remember, Jesus Christ said, I'm the bread of, of life. He said, you know, I'm the bread of God that came down from heaven. And, uh, you, you know, unless you eat of my flesh, drink of my blood, you don't have any life in you. And those stuff, of course, so you have to um, receive Christ and receive his broken body and his shed blood for us. Well, this is what they're doing with the Passover lamb. But then look at verse number nine. I mean, are we going to say, okay, everything up to this point? Absolutely. That just is, is so clearly talking about the crucifixion of Christ and his shed blood on the cross. Everything represents Christ, his sinless body. But then that, that, now we stop. Now we stop with all the references, all the symbolism. And that, and that we just, we're just going to stop. That's it, right? Why? Because you don't like what it says? Look at verse number nine. Eat not of it raw, nor sodden at all with water, but roast with fire. His head with his legs and with the pertinence thereof. And ye shall let nothing of it remain until the morning. And that which remaineth of it until the morning, ye shall burn with fire. Notice all the, the detail going into 
Verse 8 says it's roast with fire. Verse 9 says, okay, not only is it roast with fire, don't eat it raw and don't boil it in water and don't prepare you. Know, there's no water. There's no raw. It needs to be roast with fire. You're preparing a Passover lamb, roast with fire. I mean, it takes three verses to reiterate that. You think it might have some importance? You think there might be a relevance there or some relation to the sacrifice that Christ made as our Passover lamb and three verses here dedicated to just being really clear that it must be roast with fire and don't leave any of it remain until the morning and anything that's left, you just burn it all in the fire. Of course there is. Of course, because turn if you would to Acts chapter 2, which is also, by the way, a quotation from Psalm 16, another psalm that references this. Jesus Christ's soul went to hell. The hell that is full of fire and brimstone. Which is why it's important that the, sac the, the lamb sacrifice is roast with fire. It clearly represents that. And there are people who say that what I'm saying is blasphemy. How is that blasphemous? First of all, how is that blasphemous? Like, like, how could that be blasphemous? Even if you just completely disagree, how is that blasphemous? What well, you're saying, what he did on the cross isn't enough. So you're saying all he had to do was, was die on the cross? Because there's more that he had to do than die on the cross. He had to rise again from the dead. Amen. What is his death if he didn't rise? The Bible says in Ephesians 4, 8, Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it? But that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth. Amen. He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. You have to have the resurrection. If Christ is not risen, then ye are yet in your sins. He had to rise again from the dead. So, of course, that's, that's perfect. You know what else he had to do? He had to live a perfect life. He had to be that unleavened bread. Amen. He had to fulfill everything. Amen. So, yeah, the, the cross was also extremely important. You, you could not have the, the, the penalty for sins paid without the, the crucifixion on the cross. It all had to be there. The shedding of blood, of course, he had to shed his blood, but then you know what? His blood also had to be sprinkled on the mercy seat. Amen. That was all part of it. it was, it's all important. We can't have any part missing. And he made sure that he, can, that he did every part because he didn't even give up the ghost until he was done making sure that he's fulfilling all the prophecies that he could fulfill on this earth when he finally said, it is finished. And see, some people will uh, turn that around and be like, see, everything he had to do to pay for your sins was done, which is why he said it is finished. But that's not what the Bible says. It doesn't say everything he needed to do to pay for your sins was done when he said it is finished. Because he didn't rise again from the dead, he didn't sprinkle his blood in the mercy seat, and he wasn't in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights at that point. But what was finished was his earthly ministry. As a, as a man on this earth. As soon as his flesh died, that earth, I mean, he's done. He's done doing all the things. He, he, he's, he survived through when the soldiers parted his garments and cast lots for his vesture. He survived through where they offered up the vinegar to drink, right? That was like the last thing before he finally cried out and gave up the ghost and died. Because, be, why? Because all of those things were prophesied. He had, to, he had to remain alive through all of that stuff. He couldn't have given up. You know, I mean, that's why he didn't do certain things on this earth, because his time has not yet come. So he's like, nope, can't do that, because they'll kill me if I go do that. Right? It, I'm going to go over here and do, and do something else. Everything had to be done right, and he did it all right and in order, and one of those things is his soul going into hell. And to say that's blasphemy, how is that blasphemy? I think it just gives more glory and honor to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the fact that he went and suffered in hell for your sins. Amen. Because not only 
did he suffer on the cross and shed his blood and suffer the shame and suffer the mocking and everything else that he did. Yes, that's a, that in itself is a lot. But then on top of that, he also went to hell. It's, it's, it's just so much the more reason to give honor and respect and love to God. How is that blasphemous? It's ridiculous to say that. I mean, I won't call someone blasphemous for saying that Jesus didn't suffer in hell for us. I'm not going to blast them and be like, you're taking away all the... Look, I think that, but it's like, look, if you believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins and rose again on the third day, you know, and you're trusting in that for your salvation, you're saved. Amen. Right? But some people even try turning this into like salvation doctrine and so It's crazy. People get crazy on this stuff. It's nuts. You're making Jesus a liar when he said it is finished. It's like, you have your own private interpretation about that. And you're going to go around calling people unsaved or something or blasphemous? Like, come on, man. It's not like there's not evidence for this belief. <laughs> I think we've looked at quite a bit. And, and while we're looking, why don't we look at Acts chapter 2? Let's just look at another reference here. In fact, you know what, I'm just, I got a little bit of time, so I'm just going to read this. I only have a few verses. I'm going to read it all in context. In which, by the way, when you're, when you're describing the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ to people when, uh, when you're at the door and you're talking about this, I like referring when, when people say, because a lot of people these days will say, you know, oftentimes I'll ask a question, well, do you know where Jesus' soul was? You know, he, he was dead, right? He, he died on the cross. And then I usually will ask, well, do you know what happened three days after that, after he died? And most people will say, well, yeah, he rose from the dead. So a lot of people know that already about Christ, pretty common knowledge in the United States at least. But then I'll ask the question, well, do you know where his soul was for those three days and three nights? And some people will say, well, it was in heaven, or some people will say, I don't really know. And a few people will, will actually know what happened, but most people don't. And when I say, like, well, actually, his soul went to hell. I mean, wow, really? Like, did, you know. And when, when you say something that someone has never heard before, show them the scripture of why you say that. Amen. Right? If you're telling people something that they already know and they already believe, it's not like you have to be like, no, 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 now let me prove this to you. Right? And this is just a quick soul winning tip. Like, we use the scripture, faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Amen and amen. But please, don't beat the dead horse, as it were, proverbially, and, and just, if someone already says, like, they believe they're a sinner and that their sin's worthy of hell, you don't have to keep showing them why they're a sinner five ways a Sunday on, like, all these different passages and all these, oh, look, no, really, there's none righteous, no, not one. Look, you're just like, okay, look, I got it, right? Let's move on, right? So don't, don't do that. Don't waste your time doing that. But when people say, wow, I've never heard that before, show them why. Show them why. And Acts 2 is a great place because it's very clear that illustrates that Jesus Christ's soul uh, went to hell. Let's start reading verse number 25. The Bible says, For David speaketh concerning him. Now this is a quote from Psalm 16. I foresaw the Lord always before my face. For he is on my right hand. No, no, before that, let's just go to verse 24. Whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. So this is talking already. He's preaching about the resurrection of Christ. And that when were the pains of death loosened? The pains of death were loosened at the resurrection. The pains of death didn't stop on the cross. Those that think he only suffered on the cross and didn't suffer after that, then why would it say the pains of death were loosed at the resurrection? Because the pains of death would have been loosed at his death. But they weren't. So he had the pains of death um, loosed when he was raised up because it was not possible he should be holding of it. And then... After preaching the resurrection of Christ, the death, burial, resurrection of Christ, now he's going to bring up and quote Psalm 16 in verse number 25. For David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand that I should not be moved. 
Therefore did my heart rejoice and my tongue was glad. Moreover, also my flesh shall rest in hope, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou, thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. So that's his quotation from Psalm 16. We're not going to go back and look at that just for sake of time tonight. You can do that later if you want. Verse 29, now he's going to expound this passage. He's going to explain why he even quoted Psalm 16. Verse 29 says, Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. So let me just clear this up real quick. Because Psalm 16 is a psalm of David, and guess what? David is dead, he's buried, his grave is over there. Right? It's there to this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ. So he's explaining that this psalm isn't about David. But David spake this because he already knew the promise of God that Christ was going to rise and Christ was going to sit on the throne and that Christ was going to be resurrected from the dead. So this portion of scripture that he quoted from Psalm 16 is about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ. What about the resurrection of Christ? That his soul was not left in hell. Now, how could someone's soul be left in hell if it wasn't there ever, Amen. right? So clearly a soul had to go to hell. And, you know, when you're looking at Scripture, no one could deny this. You, you say, okay, yeah. And, and look, as a Presbyterian growing up, we, had, we were forced to memorize the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed and all these other creeds, whatever. But the Apostles' Creed, it's, it's pretty old. I mean, this dates back like, like er, really early Christianity. And... It says that Jesus, his soul descended into hell. That's like one of the phrases in there. This is, this is, this is like basic Christianity 101 that Christ's soul went to hell because it's so obvious. I mean, even unsaved people can see that Jesus Christ's soul went to hell, right? And that's not what most people, or at least most Baptists, have the problem with. It's not that his soul went to hell, but it's just, well, he didn't suffer in hell. It's kind of like, well, how can you, you know, show me the evidence of anyone or anything or any reference ever of people being in soul and not suffering in hell. His soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we, are, we all are witnesses. So his soul went to hell. And it says his flesh didn't see corruption, it didn't decay. Right? His, because his body was still in the grave while his soul was in hell. But the body was preserved for those three days and three nights. It didn't fall into corruption. It didn't decay. It was still normal you know, uh, when, he, when he resurrected from, from the earth. Right? And um, I think it's pretty clear. We've seen enough references. And these aren't the only ones. These are some of the I think stronger evidence is just to show us and demonstrate Jesus Christ's soul going to hell. Uh, it's, to me, it's clear he actually suffered in hell, and I think that's what Psalm 88 is about. It's, it's about facing that the wrath in hell, the destruction in hell, that grave, that, that imminence of, of having to do this. It, it's, it's one of the reasons why Jesus Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane was, was, so, was sweating so uh, severely and so earnestly that it was, as it were, drops of blood. I mean, he's like just really just kind of pouring over what he had to face in, in just a short matter of time um, with being up all night, being convicted, being mocked, being beaten up, all the stuff he had to go through and then also facing after all of that, not a reprieve, but a descent into hell and into the lowest hell. I mean, if he had to pay for the sins, like I said before, the sins of the whole world, you know, and there's various levels, well, that's going to absolutely put him at the lowest hell, which is what we saw in Psalm 88. Thou hast laid me in the lowest pit. So, 
Praise God for his love and his mercy on us and for the, the love to take on such a burden, such a payment. Such, I mean, I think it's, in, it's amazing and very praiseworthy that our Lord and Savior did all of this for us because we don't deserve that at all, but are, are very thankful that he did. Let's bow our heads, have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, thank you so much for dying for us and for tasting death for every man and for uh, enduring not just the shame of the cross and the pain and the suffering that you endured uh, on the earth, but also in the heart of the earth, dear Lord. Um, it's, it's hard to imagine what the dread and, what, and, and the reality of that would have been. But we thank you for loving us. We, we love you because you first loved us, dear Lord, but we, we thank you for dying for us. And God, I pray that you please help us to um, show our gratitude and our love towards you in, in all that we do. Help us to be reminded of the sacrifice that you made so that we don't get flippant about our sin or flippant even about our lives here on this earth, but that we would take it uh, gravely because you made such a sacrifice for us to even be here and to have the hope of, of our own resurrection and, and hope of life to come, life everlasting, dear Lord. And, and please help us to live for that and for you. Uh, we love you here. Please guide us and keep us all safe. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.